Okay, let's talk about biofuels. And there's no way you can get sleepy because I'm gonna wear this all class today, so. Guys, gotta tell me what my costume is. Carbon footprint, yeah. So this costume was um, made by our former colleague, Carl Mack, which we'll hear more about when we talk about transportation. So why would I wear it for today? This is the reason that we try to do biomass is people claim it has a low carbon footprint. But I think as you'll see with a lot of the sources we talk about today, that is certainly not, often not the case. Um, and so we'll talk about what it means and what is what actually is the carbon footprint of different ways that we use biomass. So just to give a status report on where we are in the US, ethanol is 10% of our gasoline in the US, pretty much all across the US. Does anybody know why or one of the reasons why? Um, that the corn, we, we produce a lot of corn in the US. The corn lobby is very um, powerful voice, I would say, in our politics. And so um, ethanol is made primarily uh, in the US from domestically from corn. And so there is this overlap of um, constituents that grow corn that gives them another product line to make it for ethanol and not just sell it for, for food. And so there is, there is definitely a, um, an interest in a lot of Midwest states that grow corn in having a lot of ethanol production. Yes. Anybody else have thoughts on why we have so much ethanol? Only six percent, ten percent. Anybody know why it's not more than ten percent of our fuel? It's blended with gasoline, and so our our current gasoline engines, just like a traditional gasoline engine, can only operate up to about ten percent ethanol. Um, beyond that, the auto companies will do not warranty your, your engine anymore. Um, ethanol has different properties than gasoline. It has an oxygen in it. Uh, it's an alcohol. You know, it burns a little bit differently. Um, and so the seals and stuff are different if you're going to have an engine that, that is able to burn um, mixes of ethanol that are higher than 10%. And so 10% is one of what we call a blend wall. It's kind of like that's as much as the auto companies want you putting in your car um, for a traditional gasoline engine. You can upgrade your car or you can buy what's called a flex fuel vehicle. And a flex fuel vehicle can operate on ethanol up to about E85, 85% ethanol blended with gasoline. Um, and in that case, it has different seals. It has a little bit different operating system. Um, I've seen estimates it's only about $150 to modify a ga regular gasoline car to a, a flex fuel, so it's not a big cost for the auto companies, um, but there would have to be demand for that. Um, so you can modify it to operate on higher percentages, um, but most of them cannot. Okay, so let's get into biofuels. So biofuels, again, you're taking the biomass that exists and you're doing stuff to it in order to get the biofuel that we can use, primarily ethanol and, and biodiesel. So it has kind of the same concerns we've already talked about in terms of biomass um, and, and fuel and crops and things like that in terms of concerns that we have. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other properties. One of the things that we worry about is fertilizer use on our crops. So corn in particular is, has a high fertilizer um, rate in terms of fertilizing land for, for corn production. And as we saw the increase in demand for ethanol in the US, which was driven by, by policy at the federal level, was driven by requirements of biofuels being put into our, into our fuel system to try to reduce our, our, imp, our um, dependence on foreign oil, um, we saw a lot of more land go to corn production. And that really had a big impact on some of our waterways. This is just one example. Um, there's kind of an annual dead zone now in the Gulf of Mexico because of the fertilizer loading on the Mississippi River um, that goes down to the Gulf of Mexico um, and causes these algae blooms that then die off and kind of starve the, the water of oxygen and, and cause these areas where plants and animals can't live. Um, so we've seen this in the Gulf. We've seen it in Chesapeake Bay. And a lot of it has been connected with this increase in corn production associated with our demand for ethanol um, domestically. So it has some, some major impacts on the environment. 
So why do we go to biofuels when it was touted and we started our, our federal policies about it? Was not only we can we can you know, reduce our, our oil use, we can make it domestically, but also hey hey it's it's carbon neutral, right? Well, as we've already talked about, um, biomass even as like a tree is is arguably not carbon neutral, certainly not on the timescales we care about. Um, biofuels take even more energy inputs. And so this is the cycle, right? You're growing the crops, you're making it into the alcohol, you're fermenting them, and then you're using it and you're burning CO2, which goes back into the crops. But each of these stages has an energy input, which makes it not a carbon neutral cycle. Um, and we've seen a lot of studies that have shown this. There's, it's interesting when you look at the studies because there's kind of a range of whether it's carbon neutral or not. But the most recent studies have really shown um, that it is definitely not carbon neutral, it is carbon positive. Um, so this is a, a recent study that was done um, by the National Academy of Sciences that shows that ethanol's carbon intensity is about 24% uh, higher than gasoline. Um, this counterdicts a federal study done by the USDA which said that ethanol was 40% lower than gasoline. And so we still see, you know, we've, we've kind of been doing these studies for decades now uh, uh, my background is in um, studying biofuels. I looked at it more from the air pollution side than the greenhouse gas emission side when I did my, my PhD um, back in 2012. Um, but at that point, we were still arguing, we were still arguing about whether it was positive or negative. Um, any study that looks at land use and the inputs on the farm will show that it is worse than gasoline. And so, Oftentimes it's like, did they include indirect land use change in their study? And that will be the difference on whether it's looked at as being less carbon intensive or more carbon intensive than gasoline. Okay, so the main biofuels that we use today are ethanol and biodiesel. Ethanol is just an alcohol. It's literally what you're drinking in your beer. That's ethanol, right? That's, that's an alcohol. Um, it, it ha actually, the, the fuels, even the 100% ethanol, often has about 15% gasoline in it. That's why we talk about E85, um, because we don't want people drinking it. We're not selling this as a, as a drinking alcohol. We're selling it as a fuel. And so the gasoline is considered a denuterant. It's something that you wouldn't be drinking. Just fun facts. Um, ethanol has a lower energy density. So it takes about a gallon and a half of ethanol to equal a gallon of gasoline. And so when you're thinking about your fuel economy of your vehicle, you're having to fill up a lot more often if you're using ethanol as, as your fuel. Like I said, we're using E10. Um, it's not just uh, because it's a biofuel, it's also an octane booster. Ethanol has a very high octane. And so it, it boosts the octane in your fuel. And it's, it's an oxygenate. It has that oxygen molecule on it, and so it helps the fuel go all the way to CO2 rather than having emissions of carbon monoxide, which is poisonous to us. So having that extra oxygen in the fuel also helps it clean, it burn better in terms of carbon monoxide going to carbon dioxide. Biodiesel, um, similar inputs. We'll talk about the different feedstocks. Um, that's the other main biofuel in use today. Um, you're limited on how much biodiesel you can put into a diesel engine. So I put up here B20, because it also has an oxygen on it, which diesel does not. And so your diesel engine isn't really made to operate on biodiesel. And so there's a limit on how much you can put in there. Renewable diesel, also using biomass resources, but you're actually making diesel with it. So it's a different process, but you can make a complete drop in fuel. It's actually diesel that can go into your vehicle. And so you can use 100% renewable diesel. Um, for the remaining diesel buses on campus, for example, they're renews using renewable diesel. But as you've seen, most of those are going away and going to electric for on-campus buses. Okay, so it is a growing area, but slowly, I would say the hype about biofuels has come down a lot in the last five years. Um, with the challenges of making it in a more sustainable manner, which we'll talk about, and um, with other alternatives coming that are um, like electrification that have really been more of the focus, at least for, for personal vehicles. Um, in this chart, this is showing global production. You see ethanol and biodiesel dominate. The HVO, HEFA, that is 
more terms, it's just renewable diesel. So those are the drop-in diesel. Um, that's still a pretty small portion, but it's more and more of the growth is happening. Much of the biofuels produced in the US are in the world are here domestically. We produce a lot of ethanol. Brazil produces a lot of ethanol, and the EU produces a lot of uh, biodiesel. So this is showing the share of transport demand in different countries. Um, so very small percent, about you know, um, it's that 10% ethanol that we have kind of all in our in our vehicles. So you can see that's showing up as our biofuel share of transport demand. Brazil and Indonesia have a much higher percentage, and we'll talk about Brazil a little bit as a case study. So what does that look like? This is our transportation consumption. Uh, it's a little bit old, because it actually takes a lot to figure out this data. Um, but you, as you guys know, it's petroleum dominated. Biomass is that little 10% wedge up there in terms of our transportation sector. Bringing it home to California, um, this is showing you California's non-fossil um, fuel motor um, fuel mix. Um, so you can see you know, about half of it is ethanol. It's that E10. We have a little bit of biodiesel, a lot more renewable diesel in California than biodiesel, which we'll, we'll see more other places. Um, a small portion of biomethane. Uh, so that's going into your natural gas cars. So a lot of that is buses in, in California, and then a tiny little bit of electricity. Um, so this is all driven by California policy. We have a low carbon fuel standard that drives us to use fuels that have a lower carbon intensity than a baseline of gasoline and diesel. And if we have time, we'll talk more about that. OK, so let's talk about ethanol for a little bit. Ethanol production, um, you can make it from the sugars of, a, of uh, a crop. So on corn, we're making it from the, the parts of the corn, the kernels, the parts that we eat. That's the only part that we're using to make the ethanol. The rest of it is, is kind of a waste stream. Same thing with sugar cane. You're making it with the sugars, and you're fermenting it. It's an alcohol. You're making an alcohol just kind of like you would um, a beer or something like that. The difference between corn, which is how we make it here, we grow a lot of corn in the US, and so we're making corn ethanol. Brazil grows a lot of sugar cane, they make sugar cane ethanol, is how productive the land is. So this is just showing you corn, it's only, you only get about 400 gallons of ethanol per acre per year, whereas sugar cane, you're getting 1,400 gallons of ethanol per acre per year. It's much more productive. This becomes important because they meet different categories in our policies, and we'll talk more about that. It's like how renewable are these fuels? When you're making it from corn and you're making it from sugar cane, you get a different category because of the productivity uh, per land. Cellulosic ethanol um, or cellulosic biofuels, this was kind of considered the holy grail when we were really looking at biofuels um, because we could, if we could make biofuels out of waste streams, out of paper, out of the residues, out of the rest of the plant, the leaves and the stalks and everything else that's left in the plant, that would be much more um, environmentally friendly. And we could use, they, we often talk about using grasses, for example, to make biofuels. Um, then you could grow them on marginal lands rather than using crop lands. The challenge with cellulosic biofuels is that we haven't been able to do it commercially at scale. Um, there was a lot of promise, I would say, you know, a decade and a half ago where we were going to be able to make this happen. It still hasn't happened um, in terms of doing it at scale. Those parts of the plants are much harder to break down. There's a reason, right, right cows have like four stomachs in order to be able to break down grasses, and yet we can eat like sugar and, and corn, right? Those were way easier to digest than the, the stalks and the leaves and everything else. It's much harder to make these biofuels out of cellulosic. We haven't been able to do it, even though there was the promise that that would be a lot more environmentally friendly way to make these fuels. All right, so in terms of global ethanol production, it is, it's really the US and Brazil. We dominate this game, and you can see the increase in ethanol production uh, over time in, in the US. For Brazil, it, their emphasis on ethanol was really a response to the Arab oil embargo in the 70s. So just like we saw, we kind of, we put in place our, and we'll talk about this more, we put in place a lot of efficiency measures, we put in a, a fuel economy measure following the Arab oil embargo. Brazil responded by, by really 
fuel switching and fuel switching their, their vehicles to ethanol vehicles. They have a lot of sugar cane. They could make ethanol fairly easy, easily with that sugar cane, and it was domestic. Over time, they've gone more and more back to fossil fuel-driven vehicles. Um, it was just too costly, and there's a lot of air pollution impacts with using the ethanol. And so they did not stay with using a primarily ethanol system. Uh, today, more and more, they just kind of, people have options. They have fuel choice options. They have a flex fuel vehicle where they can run on gasoline or ethanol, um, and they can switch out. In the U.S., we grow our corn in the Midwest, and so those are also the places where we produce our ethanol. We talked about Iowa a couple times already um, as the largest uh, fuel ethanol producer. You're going to produce it close to where you grow it. Uh, it's really not cost effective to move the corn around. It's much more cost effective to just put the ethanol production facility near where you're growing the corn. And so we see a lot of that in the Midwest. As I mentioned, our policies for requiring a certain amount of biofuel to be in our fuel system really drove up the acreage that we use for corn. And so this is just showing you the U.S. domestic corn use. Um, the feed and residual use is, is pretty steady. It um, it's hasn't grown a lot. But the use for alcohol really has driven the, the increase in corn acreage. Um, in the U.S. And so that orange wedge is where we really are seeing the, the demand for, for our fuel um, production of ethanol. That has an impact on prices. And so especially in a year where we may not have a good corn crop or there's drought or something else that disrupts the corn crop, um, it can have a major impact on food prices. And so this is one of the big criticisms of um, our ethanol policy is this food versus fuel fight in terms of price of, of a major grain, both in the U.S. and the world. Um, and you'll see it impacts not just direct consumers that are using corn or corn products, but corn is often fed to our meat producers. So our meat producers also see a hit when the corn prices go up. Um, this has been a concern, particularly lately, because we are the, the world's largest uh, corn supplier. We're the largest exporter of corn. Um, and we're, we're having to take up some of the slack from Ukraine, which is one of the major grain suppliers of the world. And so that, was, um, that has been a challenge with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's put a lot of pressure on grain and corn prices. And so, you know, last year when, um, Biden was touting increasing ethanol requirements, increasing production of ethanol. Um, there was a lot of criticism for it because there was already these, these upward pressures on food prices globally and food supply. Okay, so that's ethanol. We'll end about talking about biodiesel and renewable diesel. So like I said, the, I already said they're different. Um, renewable diesel is a drop-in fuel. It is not, renewable diesel, unfortunately, is not tracked much. So all the numbers I'm going to show you are biodiesel. Um, but as you see, you saw renewable diesel is actually a larger portion of our biomass-based diesel in California. So in terms of biodiesel, um, we're about the quarter of the world's production. It's used a lot more in Europe um, and then Indonesia as well. Um, growing over time, still a very small portion of our diesel demand is biodiesel. Lots of different feedstocks, uh, so, and different, different parts of the world use different feedstocks. Um, in the US, we're primarily using soybeans. Asia and South America are primarily using palm oil. Europe most, mostly uses canola oil. Um, so there's different feedstocks and different um, impacts for those feedstocks. So just to zoom in on one of those, palm oil. So this is what a, a palm oil plantation looks like. Um, where you can see kind of the difference between what the forest used to look like um, on this hill where they didn't grow the palm oil and then the kind of monolithic um, palm oil uh, farm where it's just palm oil trees. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of impacts from going from that natural forest to these um, plantation crops. And that palm oil obviously is not just for biodiesel, it's also for food and, and other, other um, options for that, that palm oil. Okay, so 
There are ways to do it in a, in, a, in a more sustainable manner. This is just one study that showed that you can, instead of just having nothing growing underneath it, you can grow some things underneath it. Um, but it doesn't replace habitat that's lost. And so we see this in, in places like the orangutan's habitat that has dramatically um, been decreased and their population decreased from those palm oil plantations. So one of the challenges with biofuels as we've talked about. Biofuels require a lot of water use, um, which we've mentioned. And finally, I just wanted to give you a sense of our federal policy that drives it. It's called the Renewable Fuel Standard. Um, at the federal level, I told you there are these different categories. Um, corn, ethanol can only meet this bottom category and you can see the requirements for it isn't growing. The idea was for the less renewable biofuels, we're just gonna cap it and not require more. And the plan was to grow like the cellulosic and the advanced bio, biofuels, which we haven't been able to make uh, economically. Um, so that's the policy that's driving it. In California, it's the low carbon fuel standard. California, they count this, this land use. This is indirect land use. And so see, you're comparing it to the gasoline. Corn ethanol doesn't meet California's standards for a low carbon fuel standard, but the sugarcane ethanol does. And so this the second one is sugarcane ethanol, even including the indirect land use. It's, it's considered um, less carbon intensive than gasoline. So an unintended consequence, which I like to point out in some of these policies, is that what we do in the US is we export corn ethanol to Brazil and import sugarcane ethanol to the United States in order to meet California's low carbon fuel standard. So most of that is driven by our low carbon fuel standard in California. And so this is where you know, it's, it's hard to kind of see some of those unintended consequences. Okay, the final thing I'm gonna leave you with, I just have a summary slide, energy crops, Energy crops to biofuels um, has lots of impacts. So generally um, not able to do that in an environmentally friendly manner. Waste oils to biofuels is an area that, that aviation especially is looking into. Aviation is one of those hard to decarbonize areas, really needs a liquid fuel. And so there's a lot looking into how do we make those actual renewable fuels. Thank you guys for your attention.